Roman said, my name is Mark. If we haven't met yet, it's good to be back with you. I was here. I just wasn't speaking. Um, I know some of you were like, what do you do if you don't work your one hour a week? <laughs> it's a nice life us pastors have. Anyways, as Robin said, part four of Stuff You Didn't Hear in Sunday School, and today we're going to cover maybe the most famous story, commonly referred to as The Fall. If you grew up going to church, you know what story I'm talking about. If not, you've probably seen images of it. Just think of, you know, a woman naked biting an apple. That's the story we're covering today, okay? As you will see in the story, there's lots going on. There's naked humans. There's supernatural trees. There's a talking snake. There's the first marriage fight, not the last one, and some uncomfortable points about the pain of childbirth, which I don't know if I should be talking about. But anyways, um, and I promise at the end of today, you will never, ever look at this story the same way again. Now, before we get into it, it is week four, and this is a bit of a longer series. Like we said, we're going to take breaks, but I just figure every once in a while, it's good to have a refresher as to why we're going through these stories again. As Robin said in week one, theology matters. Theology is the study of God and how you view God matters. Because what humans believe about God and what God does and what God has done and what God will do always throughout world history impacts the way that humans do things. All over the world, political conflicts, religious conflicts, wars, societal issues, career decisions, even your parenting decisions are so often impacted by our views of God and what God does and what God says. The things we condone, the casualties we accept, the means by which we go about doing things are all impacted by our understanding of who God is. And as we'll continue to see, so much of this has been formed by these stories that we're unpacking in this series. And even if you're here today, and you're not a church person, not a Christian, even if you didn't grow up going to school, going to church or Sunday school, these stories, as Robin pointed out in week one, are embedded into the fabric of our culture. At times, you may have experienced or witnessed racism, sexism, mistreatment of the queer community, and some of these stories may have actually been used to back up this horrific behavior. And that's why unpacking these stories is so important. Personally, when I explain to people why this series and why now, I tell them, listen, in the last few years, the importance of this series became so clear to me personally when we were going verse by verse for two and a half years through the book of Luke, which is the life story of Jesus. And I would regularly have coffee with people or get emails from people, and they would say, hey, you know, know, that was a really interesting message this weekend when we talked about what Jesus said, but look at, and they would point to another story, look at what God is doing in this other story in the Bible or what God is saying in this story in the Bible. And they'd often point to an Old Testament story, often one that they had learned in Sunday school. And there was this sense that views, actions, behaviors, and words of God in these stories sometimes appeared to contradict the views, actions, behaviors, and words of Jesus. And at times, these people would use these stories to actually disagree with Jesus. And I I just became more and more aware, I can teach you Jesus all day long. But as long as we don't deal with the other stories in Scripture, the stories many of us grew up with that actually shaped our understanding of what God is like, we will continue to have this gravitational pull to understand God through these stories, sometimes over and above the God that Jesus reveals to us. And friends... Nothing should ever compete with Jesus. And so as we go through this series, you may at times feel like the way you viewed some of these stories and in turn how you viewed God is being challenged a little bit. I've sure felt that personally in the past. And I want you to realize a bit of what's at play if you're kind of shuffling in your seats and are they saying and did they say and all that, right? You know, because I've actually felt that over the years. And so um, maybe even feel a little bit defensive of how, you know, these stories are being understood or taught in a different way. So here's kind of some things that you might not realize are at play under the the currents, okay? First of all, I want you to realize that tension you feel, a lot of people feel it, but it's a newer tension. The sense of why are you messing with my Bible stories is actually a relatively new tension. Historically speaking, the Old Testament that we grew up with were actually the Hebrew scriptures. And the way that we treat these scriptures is quite different from how Jewish rabbinic tradition treated these. Even to this day, that, uh, they'll see these stories differently than we do. And we should pay attention to how people read these stories historically. 
See, in Jewish tradition, they looked at scriptures like a gem. Instead of just looking at these stories straight on, they saw that their richness comes as you sit with them, as you look at them like a gem with, from different angles, as you allow the light to refract in different ways, and that's where their beauty comes out. You look at them from a different angle, a different perspective. You talk about it with friends. That's when the beauty of the text comes out. Historically, Jewish rabbinic tradition had lots of space for different understandings of what might be happening in the story or what might be a hidden meaning in the story and in the story because historically they read these stories like a gem. Now, that has changed. In fact, many of you here today, you hear this idea of reading scripture like a gem and you're like, I've never heard that before. And so clearly we need another round of Mark's oversimplified history. So here we go, a little tangent here, okay? In the last couple hundred years, as scientific discovery and the enlightenment made more progress, there is a segment of Christian scholars who felt threatened by scientific discoveries. To be clear, we love science here, okay? But some felt threatened by it. And uh, some felt like science was a growing threat to the Christian faith. Science deals in facts. And so some Christians felt they needed their own kind of textbook of facts to compete with scientific discovery. And so they moved away from viewing scripture as this beautiful gem that you can turn and look at and get so many different ideas from and you know, reflect on and wrestle with. And they added terms that had never been used before to refer to the scriptures. In fact, terms that, in my opinion, should be reserved for Jesus, terms like inerrant and infallible, and basically said, anything and everything that you read is exactly as it is described. In a sense, no need to turn the gem. The scripture was used as a competition to scientific facts. And one of the casualties of this approach, and you'll see this throughout the series and today, is that stories that had powerful meaning and imagery were neutered of their power and instead expected to be scientific accounts to rival science. To put it another way, they took what is expected of the scientific method and laid it on top of the scriptures, which were never meant to be a scientific textbook. As you can imagine, lots of damage has been done with this approach. How's that for oversimplified history? Okay, so all that to say, in this series, we will model historically how people have read these stories as gems. Look at it from different angles, different understandings. And instead of jumping to the defense above, it has to have happened exactly as described, we're going to turn the gem and look for what meaning these stories might be trying to convey and see how the Holy Spirit might meet us in the midst of it. And that means one of the things you might realize as we get further and further into this story, series is that there will be, uh, as we go through these stories, is that even within our community, even with the people sitting around you, we might land in different places on what we understand these stories to mean, how literal or metaphorical certain stories are. But guess what? That's okay. Because wherever you land on these stories, we can all still be Jesus followers because Jesus followers aren't Jesus followers because they all agree on the exact same interpretation of these stories. Agreement has never been the litmus test of Jesus followers. The first century Jesus followers had only one thing in common. They saw a man crucified by Rome and three days later, he rose from the grave and they put their trust in him. Nobody was at the first church gatherings, you know, hiding in their homes, escaping Roman persecution and saying, hey, glad we're all sheltering in place here. <laughs> but just to be clear, uh, do you guys think the six day creation story was literal or metaphorical? Oh, okay, you know, you're gonna have to find another hiding place. Hey, Romans, hey, hey, this guy, right? Like, just imagine like that was not the litmus test. It was, we're following Jesus. We're figuring out the other stuff. Jesus is the litmus test. Jesus is our center. So in summary, how we understand these stories is like a gem. We don't try and make the text do what it was never meant to do. It wasn't meant to be a science textbook explaining exactly in scientific detail our origins. As Robin has so brilliantly said, these stories were meant to help God's people find their meaning and purpose, not how the universe scientifically began. And lastly, let me say this. Some of you, have, as I've just kind of shared that whole caveat, you're hearing me say, you know, what sounds kind of loosey-goosey, right? You're like, it sounds like, well, whatever you want the story to mean, that's great. Or it might mean that for you, but here's what it means for me. You're getting the sense that, you know, this is just loosey-goosey. And I get that, um, but that's not true. Remember, when we talk about this all the time. We have a Rosetta Stone, so to speak, for Scripture, and that's Jesus, Jesus is what helps us make sense of everything because Jesus is the litmus test. Jesus is the perfect representation of God. 
And so there will be times in the series, and even today, you're going to see this, where we will see images of things that God says or God does, and we don't just grab them at face value. We hold them up to the litmus test of Jesus. And if they don't agree, we can simply say this line. You're going to hear this a lot, okay? So get used to it. Here it is. Well, something else must be going on here. Well, something else must be going on here. Now, Personally, Rob and I love digging in and trying to make sense of what could actually be happening here. You'll hear us say things like, yeah, scholars disagree on this, or here's a few explanations um, or perspectives of what might be happening, or maybe this is the people writing from their view what they perceive to be the reality, right? Like, there's all kinds of things, but let me be clear. When something seems to contradict Jesus, knowing what is actually going on there is not necessarily, not necessary to just know, hey, that's not like Jesus, And so honestly, as we bump up against some of those things, maybe in your quiet time or in conversations with friends, you can kind of just shrug your shoulders and say, yeah, looks like something else is going on here because Jesus is the perfect image of God and that isn't like Jesus. You don't need to be able to dot every I and cross every T to know something is not like Jesus. Okay, that's the end of the tangents. Let's get into the story and I'll try and model what I've just talked about, okay? So Genesis chapter three, verse one, if you'd love to follow along with your device or um, your paper Bibles, but uh, as, we, as you kind of find your place, it's probably like the second page in your Bible. We're making it really simple for you, okay? Um, let me just add this last caveat. There is so much in this story. We're not going to cover it all, but I can encourage you. Robin is launching uh, Bible Untamed, which starts March 7th. Actually, is that this? What's, what, just, is that this week? That's this week. Are you ready for that? That's intense. That's like going to seminary. I, there was about 30 people in the last round, and everyone I talked to just loved it. That's where they just get to dig. Like, if you're like, oh, I want to pull on that thread. I wish, you know, Mark or Robin had talked more about that on Sunday. Go to Bible Untamed. It's awesome. So anyways, um, with that said... Uh, we'll cover what we can cover today. Genesis 3.1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Okay, so opening scene, the snake shows up. Now, question, is it a real snake or is the snake a metaphor for temptation? Does the snake represent the voices in our heads and the sneaky, cunning ways that we convince ourselves to do things our own way instead of God's way? Those are great questions. Scholars disagree on that. Really smart people disagree on that. But the thing, so this is the thing, often we get distracted by details and it's like, but here's the thing we can't ignore. Eve is experiencing a temptation to ignore her creator. You ever felt that? Remember, these stories are like mirrors of the experiences of the Israelites and ultimately every human, including us. You ever felt the temptation to ignore God? Me too. Verse two, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Circle that in your Bibles. We'll come back to that, okay? The snake responds. You'll not certainly die, the certain serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good from evil. What's the snake doing? The snake is bringing into question things we wrestle about as well. Can God be trusted? Does God actually care about what's best for me? Is God just there to make sure we don't have any fun? These are the temptations that Eve is starting to wrestle with, and we've all wrestled with these. Story written thousands of years ago. It has all these powerful images of our lived experience, and we get distracted by, and is the snake literal or not, right? See how we can get distracted and miss the point? Let's keep going. Verse six. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Now, again, if we try and make this make sense in a literal way, we kind of have some challenges. I mean, look at this line right here, right? Also desirable for gaining wisdom. Have you ever looked at a fruit and thought, oh yeah, clearly that one's gonna give me more wisdom, right? Like, did it have nutritional facts written on it? Like three grams of sugar, 27% vitamin C for your intake for the day may lead to more wisdom, right? Like, what is happening here? Maybe something else is going on. Maybe the point is she chose, as we often do, to go against what God says, to go against the way of God. She chose to center herself and her perspective in the story and do what she wanted to do. Now, I've personally never done that before, but maybe you have. Imagine, imagine. Let's keep reading. She also 
gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. I always loved this part of the story. I always understood it as if Adam and Eve hadn't eaten the fruit, naked would just be, nakedness would just be commonplace all the time. And yet, thanks to Adam and Eve, we got to put pants on in the morning, right? Like that's how I always read this story as a kid. And the implied idea here is we were meant to live naked and to be completely oblivious of good and evil. And we could have stayed that way forever if our ancestors hadn't screwed up and eaten the fruit. But since they did, now we all know the difference between good and evil and we got to put our pants on in the the morning. Thanks, guys, right? Now that's a fair assumption, but let's turn the gem a little bit and ask some questions. If that's the case, if this is now the new human nature that all of us inherit, then wouldn't inherit, then wouldn't being naked be something that every human feels uncomfortable with from the time they're born? Like babies from the time they are born root for mother's milk, right? Like right away, they just like it's in the eight in them. And yet, you don't even have kids to know. Kids love being naked. Nakedness is king. And like, not even like they don't even realize, like they know they're naked. They want to show you everything. Like that's my house all the time, right? It's like, it's like literally the opposite. It is like in their nature to be naked and show it all off, right? And as they get older and as they mature, then, then they start wanting privacy. Then they want to start covering up a little bit. So what if something else is happening here? What if the story is about experiencing the pain of maturing too quickly? What if we stop looking at Adam and Eve as these first superhumans and more like children, at least adults with the innocence of children? What if the plan all along was that they would slowly mature into their humanity with God as their guide, you know, gently like a parent saying, yeah, this is a good way to go and not this way and stay away from this or this later, not now, right? Like this gentle guiding. And it's not that they were never gonna become aware of the good and evil in the world, but when they refused to do it God's way in God's time, they ended up ripping off the Band-Aid, so to speak, before the right time, before they were mature enough to handle this information. Years ago, I went, actually decades ago, it's always scary when you talk decades ago and you're not in diapers, but decades ago, I was on a high school field trip to the Toronto courthouse. And I don't know if they still do that. Maybe after this story, teachers will stop doing this. But we went to the courthouse and uh, they stood us in the lobby and they, we were kind of in, I think it was with our law class. And so we're in the lobby and they're kind of saying, hey, if you want to learn about fraud, you can go to this room and you know this crime and this place, this thing. And then they said this, they said, but whatever you do, don't go to courtroom number nine. Dismissed. Bernard and I look at each other. We don't even need words. We go to courtroom number nine. I remember every part of that experience. I remember the security guard when we opened the doors kind of looking at us like you really shouldn't be here, but legally I can't stop you from being here. I remember the wood paneling in the room. I remember the judge and the bench, the judge sat behind. I remember the court reporter speaking into this kind of mass thing, recording everything that was happening. I remember the accused. I remember exactly what he looked like. I remember his mother weeping two rows in front of us. I remember the judge reading the accusations detail by detail by detail. It's been 20 years. I still remember every detail. We left the courtroom that day, Bernard and I. We literally abandoned the field trip and took the subway home. Here's the point. It's not that we should have never heard that stuff. In my work, I hear stories like that all the time. But at that age, I wasn't ready for them. I wasn't mature enough. I was warned. I didn't listen. What if the story of Adam and Eve and about Adam and Eve and the fruit is less about the fact that if they hadn't eaten the fruit, we'd still be living in a garden, walking around naked and completely oblivious to good and evil in the world. And what if it's more a story about God warning God's people of what happens when we don't listen to God's voice, when we don't listen to that voice that has our best in mind? Here's how I would summarize this question. What if the story is at least partially about the way they tried to take hold of a good thing in the wrong way at the wrong time? Well, that would be a powerful story that speaks directly to what we are tempted with every single day, to trust and follow God or to do it our own way. Guess what? 
That's only the first half of the story. Don't worry, we'll move quickly for the second half, but I wanna fast forward a little bit into the next part of the conversation that God has with them about their now unauthorized meal that they had, okay? But the first part, what if the story is partially about the way they tried to take hold of a good thing in the wrong way at the wrong time? Verse eight, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to man, where are you? Talk about lived experience. How many times do we hide from God? Do we move away from God in shame and embarrassment when we do something wrong? You ever done that? I have. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Now we'll circle back to this later, but pay attention to the odd parts. This God isn't raging mad. This God in this moment is inquiring. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Adam blames his wife. There's something I can't identify with at all. Never done that a day in my life, imagine. (laughs) Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you've done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Everyone just blaming everybody. Nobody takes responsibility. Do you see yourselves in this story? I see myself in this story. So uh, So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this. And then if you know the story, the next five verses are all the consequences that they now have to face because of it, right? The sna- I'll give you the list, right? The snake, the snake is now cursed for, you know, for having done this. So now the snake has to crawl on its belly and eat dust forever, okay? Men and women, you will now have tension, it's said. Men will now rule over women. Women will now have pain in childbirth. And men, the ground is now cursed because of you and you'll have to sweat to make a living. Now, I grew up understanding this story was telling us why work was hard and why women experience pain in childbearing. But I'd love to give you kind of turn the gem again and give another lens to look at this story. Because often this story gets used in so many ways that I feel are an exercise in missing the point. I've heard this story used as a model for gender roles. I've heard it used in arguments against epidurals because you don't want to get in the way of God's punishment, right? I've heard people debating if snakes had legs before this because it's like, well, if now it's on its belly, you know, there's a whole Reddit thread on this. Like, let me show you some of the pictures people have concocted. Ready for this? (laughs) Like, I think it was a gift that now has to crawl on its belly. I don't want to ever encounter that. It's like, thank God for the curse, right? But like, seriously, you just deep dive, right? Like even like, 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 well, do snakes actually eat dust? And then there's like all these people who like need to prove it. So they have all these, it's it's fascinating and a great exercise and completely missing the point. And here's why, you know, I just ask, is it possible there's something else going on here? Here's why I ask that. When we hold the declaration of these consequences towards humans up to Jesus, all of a sudden we have some challenges, don't we? Right? The pain in childbirth is an example. Jesus, who's the perfect representation of God, never gives people pain when they make a mistake. What does he do? He shows them grace. In fact, there is a time when Jesus and his disciples encounter a blind man and the disciples ask, was it his sin or his parents' sin that led him to be blind? Because the common understanding in the day was that if you were disabled in any way, you did something wrong. And what does Jesus do? He rejects that line of thinking completely. Jesus doesn't say, hey, if you're blind, it's because you did this. And if you can't walk, it's because you did this. And if you have pain in childbirth, you can thank Eve for that one. Jesus doesn't see a need to associate pain to a cause. Do we think God is like, Eve, you ate the fruit. Now billions of women for the rest of the world history will have to experience great pain in childbirth. I don't know. It just doesn't seem to be how Jesus operates. Something else might be going on here. Same with the curse on the ground and now work is gonna be miserable. Again, if that's the idea, shouldn't we see see work as something that Jesus hates because it's evil? Something to try and get rid of? And yet when God shows up in the flesh, when God chooses to walk on the earth, God shows up as a carpenter, as a blue collar worker. All throughout the New Testament, work is seen as good and beautiful. And if we're honest, some of our best experiences in life are when we feel we are working at something that we are genuinely created to do. Work is an evil. So again, what's our line? Maybe something else is going on here. So what could be happening here? 
Well, if we stay in the vein that this story is like a mirror, showing humans what happens when we live apart from God, what happens when we choose to listen to competing voices, when we choose to do things our own way instead of God's way, maybe a good way to summarize what all of this is trying to say to the ancient audience is life gets hard when we do things without God. Life gets hard when we do things without God. We've talked about how God lets God's children write the story, you know, carried along by the Holy Spirit. But the authors, the biblical authors are using their own language and even some of their own biases. And is it possible that this is Israel trying to make sense of the hard things in life? This is being written when they're in exile. They've been banished from their land. They're trying to tell their story. And the story of Adam and Eve is this perfect mirror of their and our lived experiences and the temptations that we face. And I think the message is getting across loud and clear. When we do things our own way in our own wisdom apart from God, life gets hard. Now we could spend so much more time turning the gem and asking questions. You're welcome to dig into it. But uh, uh, for now, let me just bottom line it with this. When we hold this story up to Jesus, this idea that God is this punitive punishing billions of women for one woman's choice to eat fruit, it just feels like something else is going on. Now, just before we move to the last part of the story, when I was at rehearsal this week, um, some of the pastors said, hey, Mark, we really like that summary of life gets hard when we move away from God. Um, We think that's a great point, but can you just take a moment before you move to the closing part of your message and clarify that the opposite is not also true? That when people choose to follow God, it doesn't mean that life will all of a sudden be breezy and rainbows, right? Like, fair, right? Like, let's just be honest. Almost all the disciples who chose to follow Jesus ended up dying horrific deaths at the hands of the Romans, okay? Choosing to follow Jesus is not this free pass to a happy life. It's just saying that at times when we go against God, we go against the fabric of the world that God created, and that can make things hard as well. So just want to clarify that. Okay. Um, now, are you still with me for this last part? Everyone just nod. Yeah, still wait. It'd be okay if you were napping, but just, yeah, just like to know that there's a few with me. Okay, uh, one last thing to draw your attention to because I'm convinced it doesn't get enough airtime in this story, but for the original audience who would hear this, this is the part of the story that would blow their minds. So let's just jump into it quickly, okay? Um, remember the beginning of the story. Uh, what does God warn them? If they eat the fruit, what will happen? They will... Die, you are still with me. Okay, great. So what is missing in this story is death from the deity, but they don't die, right? Now, my entire life, I've heard all kinds of explanations for why they didn't die. In fact, I've actually preached some of them over the years. I and many other preachers try and do gymnastics to make sure God doesn't look like he said he was gonna do something and then not do it. Here's how it sounds. Well, when God said death, God really meant death to the kind of life God intended for us. That's one perspective. Or another explanation that I would give was, well, technically didn't, God didn't say immediate death. So, you know, now life has an end. You know, we get 60, 70, 80 years, but all of us now die. Thanks, Adam and Eve, right? And so we just kind of try and do all the gymnastics to make the text line up when all the I's dotted and T's crossed. Again, we're treating it like a science textbook, and we need to make a way to say that God was telling the truth and that they did, in fact, die, even though they're still alive, right? But again, that is taking a modern lens, putting it on an ancient text, and when we do that, we neuter the text of part that would be the most powerful for the original audience. Remember, in the ancient world, a death threat from a god, that would be totally normal for that audience. People's understanding at that time was that if there, a god or gods threatened death, it was literal death they were threatening. You disobeyed, you dropped dead. To the ancients, no amount of our explanations of, well, eventually they'll die from old age would make any sense to them. A death threat is a death threat. And that means to read this through the eyes of the ancient audience, from their perspective, this is mind-blowing. It's about a deity who threatened death and then chose to withhold that punishment. That is what would make headlines in this story. God says God will kill them if they disobey, and when they disobey, God doesn't kill them. Instead, we find this almost gentle seeming God in comparison. You should read the other accounts in history of the deities, okay? This God seems gentle. Walking in the garden in the cool of day amongst God's creation, asking them, calling out and asking them what happened. Here are a few things that would blow the mind of the ancient reader. 
okay? Um, and there's more than three, but we don't have time for more, so let's just do three. So number one, they run from God, God comes searching for them. They run from God, God comes searching for them. Why would someone run from a God? Because they fear death. But this God is approaching them not with violence and retribution, but with conversation and relationship. Number two, they screwed up and God shows grace and forgiveness. God is choosing to look past the wrong, to forgive, to not give the punishment that they deserve. This God breaks with God's own rules to move towards relationship. I love the way Richard Rohr says it. It's so powerful. You need to sit with this one. Ready for this? Every time God forgives, God is saying the relationship is more important than God's own rules. And then number three, God clothes them. In verse 21, it says this, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. In the ancient world, if you did something wrong in your family, you stripped someone's clothes away to signify you were stripping away their inheritance and they were out of the family. To do the opposite to clothe them was to reinstate an inheritance. You were clothing them in the inheritance. Remember the story of the prodigal son, if you've ever heard that story? He comes home after having abandoned his family and his father gives him a robe, a robe, a ring, and sandals and welcomes him back into the family. So in this story, the first humans do something wrong and God goes out of God's way to make them clothes. God is saying, not only am I not stripping away your inheritance, I'm reminding you that even though you did wrong, my love for you won't be impacted. I will go out of my way to clothe you and keep you in the family. Can I summarize one way that we could look at this story and what we've kind of learned today? This story was a reminder to the Israelites that they worshiped a God unlike any deity they had ever heard of. A God who chooses love over rules, grace and mercy over vengeance, relationship over retribution. Is that the image you have of God? Or some of the images you grew up with competing with that? I wonder if we could invite Randy up. And we always just like to create some space at the end for us to just reflect on what we've heard. I wonder if we can just sit for a moment and reflect on maybe some of the unhealthy images that we have of God and rebuilding some more beautiful ones. Maybe you have an unhealthy view of God that needs to go. Maybe you have seen God as retributive, dishing out pain in response to disobedience. Maybe you've been through great pain or you're going through great pain and you've been attributing the pain to God as punishment for something you did. In Jesus, we learn that God never responds to mistakes by inflicting pain. Something else is going on there. Maybe you've been hiding from God. Maybe you did something wrong or there's something that you felt you were supposed to do and you didn't do it. And that has led you to actually pull away or kind of hide like Adam and Eve. You feel embarrassment or shame. Maybe you've been hiding Maybe you've been avoiding a quiet time, avoiding prayer, avoiding your small group. Maybe you're, you're watching online because you're like, I don't even want to be in the room. I just feel so embarrassed and so ashamed. Maybe you need to sit with the fact that in this story, as they hide, God goes looking for them. God is not sitting at home with God's arms crossed, waiting for them. God is making the first move, reinstating them into the family. Maybe this story is inviting you to be like God to somebody else. Maybe someone has wronged you. Maybe they've intentionally distanced themselves from you because they're scared because of what they did to you. And you've been wanting to give them exactly what they deserve. And maybe in this story, the Holy Spirit is inviting you not to wait for them to return, but to seek them out and to metaphorically make them close. You know, in a sense, do something they don't deserve because that's what Jesus does for us. Or maybe there's something else in the story that the Holy Spirit is bringing to mind for you. So why don't we just sit still for a minute and see how the Holy Spirit speaks to us, would we?
As you go, I just want to remind you of a few things. If you're new and you feel comfortable, pop by guest services and grab some freshly roasted coffee or loose leaf tea just as a thank you gift for coming. And uh, secondly, our prayer teams up at the front, Marion and Sharon, and they're happy to pray with you for anything that's going on in your life. They'd be delighted. Um, and then also a reminder, the tea room is open today. Uh, they have many reservations, but I think they still have some rooms. So if you want to go have tea or actually grab lunch there, uh, the, the uh, proceeds from that actually come and support this church. So uh, eat lots. Have a fantastic week, friends, and we'll see you next week. Bye for now.